Let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, the, the music as we've worshipped and lifted your name, and as we come to your word now that you would open our hearts, you would draw us to you, help us to learn and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I love the Christmas season, uh, but I'm not quite ready to preach about the events of Christmas. Uh, instead, we'll leave that to next Sunday on Christmas Eve. Uh, this morning, though, I want us to lead up to Christmas, all right? I want to be looking at uh, one of the most underread portions of the New Testament, uh, Matthew chapter 1. So turn to Matthew chapter 1, if you would. We see verses 1 through 17, probably the most the least read area of the New Testament, verses 1 through 17, the earthly genealogy of Jesus Christ. And in this today, we're going to see uh, three things that reveal the character of God and those those character traits that each of us need in our lives. So let's begin. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab Nason, and Nason begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. There's a name we recognize. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, Joram begat Ozias, Ozias begat Jotham, Jotham begat Ahaz, Ahaz begat Hezekiah, Hezekiah begat Manasseh, Manasseh begat Amon, Amon begat Josiah, Josiah begat uh, Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. You're, you're figuring out why it's not read a lot, right? And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Shalathiel, and Shalathiel Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel Abiad, and Abiad Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, Achim begat Eliad, Eliad begat Eleazar, Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. All right. The earthly genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew. You will find another one uh, through Mary. Uh, in Luke chapter 3. And there are a few things for us to point out here about that make this genealogy different than any other one that you're going to find in the Word of God. Uh, first, it's written in a numerical way to help us remember. We have the number 14 there, 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the carrying away in Babylon, 14 generations from Babylon to Jesus Christ. In fact, this is the 14th genealogy that's recorded in the Word of God as well. Even David's name, if you, where each letter represents a number, David is 14 uh, when you add his letters together. That's fun. It helps us remember it. But there's also some very important wording uh, that we find here that Matthew uses as well. In verse 1, he states, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. It's not the generations like we see in all the other ones that are mentioned. There's no starting over with this one. There is no over and over because some failure had entered here because it is complete with Jesus Christ, the generation of Jesus Christ. Because Romans tells us in Romans 5, 12, and then verse 19, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and, by, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But then it tells us in verse 9, the generation of Jesus Christ. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen. 
So we see this. We also specify the wordings of verse 16. Turn there back to 16 if you turn the page. It says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. All through the other ones, we see a different phrasing there, do we not? We see this man begat this man, this man begat this man, this man begat, and so on and so forth. But the language changes when we come to Joseph, right? Because Jesus is the virgin born. And we see here, it's very clear that Joseph, his stepfather, it was of whom was born Jesus. Mary, of whom was born Jesus. The language is clear here that Jesus is not the offspring of Joseph. He is the virgin born. And in here, the verses, uh, uh, combining with verse 23, gives us three names for Jesus Christ. It tells us Jesus, Christ, and later on in verse 23, he calls him Emmanuel. Jesus, the Hebrew word for, uh, the Hebrew word of Jesus is Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. Christ or Messiah, the same word in Hebrew, meaning anointed. Emmanuel, he tells us specifically, God with us. So every name of Jesus Christ is pointing to exactly who he is. God with us, the anointed. Jehovah is salvation. And as we look at this now, and as we look at these things, we're, we're going to look at the character of God and how it applies to your life today. And the easy thing to remember, we're going to look at two, three, and four, all right? Two, three, and four. That's how you can remember today's uh, message. The first thing we see is two kept promises. Verse one, two kept promises. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Two kept promises we're going to see with these two men. Now, Matthew's audience, go ahead and just put me on this. I'm back and forth here. Uh, Matthew's audience was to the Jews. That, that was his audience that the, the gospel account was going to them. And this verse would have captivated them. Instantly, they would have been, they would have been listening. Because those are the two hallmarks there. You add Moses in there, and those are the three. But this we have here, we have Abraham and we have David. So they immediately would have looked. And linking Jesus to Abraham and to David linked him to the foundational covenants, the foundational promises that God had made with Israel. God made other covenants with Israel during the time, during Moses. There's other covenants that God made, but all of those were conditional. The Jews had to do something to keep that promise alive, to keep it valid. They had to play a part in that. But with Abraham and with David, the covenants there were promises God made to these men that were unconditional. There was nothing on their part that they could possibly do. This was all given to them by God, him showing his mercy and showing his grace toward them. With Abraham, God promised that his descendants would number as the sand of the sea and as the stars of the sky. Through Abraham in the covenant, it says that all the world would be blessed. Through Jesus Christ, all the world has been blessed. Abraham was this man of faith, and it tells us that it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was imputed to him for righteousness, as, as James tells us. And up until Jesus Christ, all of Abraham's descendants had been physical in nature. They were physical descendants of, of his. They were the Hebrews. But after Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the full fulfillment of this promise took place. And we are blessed because of that. Through salvation in Jesus Christ, we are of the lineage now of Abraham. That promise has been kept through David. God promised that the kingdom would never leave his lineage. And as we read through this genealogy, we, we watch how God kept his promise through Joseph. In Luke chapter 3, we see how he kept his promise through Mary as well. Both parents, descendants of David. Joseph goes through the line of David to Solomon. Mary goes through the line of David to Nathan, his other son Nathan, through Bathsheba as well. And we see Jesus Christ, the true anointed, the true Christ and Messiah, 
And just as you would look in the history in the Old Testament at how, how priests and prophets and kings were anointed, so we see Jesus Christ, the true anointed, both prophet, priest, and king, his spiritual kingdom. The spiritual kingdom of God today is where he is king, and in the future we will see his physical kingdom come and be on this earth. And that alone, you say, what's all this apply to me? That should humble us. That should cause us to praise the Lord for who he is and what he is. Because what we see here is it should reassure us and it should invigorate us that if he's keeping these promises through time, through for Adam and through Abraham and David, the complexity of the generations to keep David on the throne, the measures to take one man's family and build it to where it blesses the entire world, Is it hard to believe then that he's going to keep the promises that he's told us? Those that we find in the New Testament for you and for me? Is it hard to believe that he's going to keep those when he says, I will never leave you or forsake you? I can believe that promise. The complexities of just what he did with David and Abraham. That when he says that all things work together for good to them that love God. I can believe that promise. I can believe that I, when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I can believe that promise, that when my life here is ended, that the Lord will be there for me, and I will, be, I will rest in him. I can believe the promise that it says, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations. Are you going through a tribulation today? The Lord promises us that he will be there and he will comfort us. I can believe that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we can overcome the sinful nature that we are through Jesus Christ. That he'll give us peace when we come to him. I think the the angel Gabriel, during what we celebrate the Christmas season, said it best when he's speaking to Mary. And he says, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen? We can believe the promises of Jesus Christ as we look at this genealogy, how he kept his promises. And I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe some some turmoil in your life that you're you're not looking forward to Christmas. You got to be with some family and there's some just upheaval going on there. I don't know what it is. But I know the Lord can be there for you through this season. I don't know where your faith may be wavering today. But if the Lord has promised us anything, he will always keep his word. And we must rest in that. Two kept promises. We move on and we see next three eras of long-suffering. Long-suffering of Jesus Christ. Long-suffering of our Lord. Verse 17 Now, I won't go into the detail of the history behind this statement, and you all are like, amen, thank you. Uh, Watch, watch, if you want to watch one of these eras, watch Wednesday night. We went in great detail through, through this era. But as we mentioned, there are these three sets of 14 generations. Three sets of 14 generations. And in these, we see the long suffering of the Lord, his patience. That's just another way of, it's, a more, it's a more in depth than just patience. The enduring, the love that he still shows us as, he, as we are sinning and as we are falling away from him. We have Abraham to David, David to Babylon, Babylon to Jesus Christ. And in all three of these, we see something where God shows his long suffering toward us. In Abraham to David, we see the birth of the nation of Israel. All through we see him building, and it is plagued with rebellion. As you watch the Israelites walk through, uh, through the wilderness as God's made them a nation after making them, they had been slaved, and he brings them out of Egypt, and that you think they would rejoice, but they rebel, and they rebel, and they're, they're stiff-necked, and they're not listening to the Lord. Then they finally get into the land, and instead of being grateful for what God had given them, they still, they start to fall away, and they rebel once again, over and over, and God continues to bring a judge. God continues to, to bring people into their life, and even each time the Lord has, was long-suffering, and he brings them back to him. And it continues on. David becomes king now, and there's the, the kingdom continues to go on. And 
There's civil war because they're not following the Lord. The generations, they would wane back and forth, some following the Lord, some not following the Lord, and they would rebel ever so slowly, leading farther and farther away from the Lord. Each time, he tries to bring correction to bring them back to him, and eventually he sends them into captivity. Even then, the Lord gives them mercy. And as they're in Babylon, he says, it's only going to be 70 years, and I'm going to bring you back. This whole purpose is to point you to me. And they continue to rebel, and the Lord brings them back into the land. It cured them of their paganism. But now they replace their paganism with a legalism to where now they are become the determiners of what is right and wrong. And they've denied the, the law of God and surrounded it with their own buildings of themselves and the point is that all this disobedience we see God's long suffering there's still a nation there's still a people he still hands them mercy he has grace for his people because he loves them there are many Christians here today and or listening and you think I've blown it the Lord's just going to put me on a shelf somewhere and he will never forgive me for what I've done he will never forgive me for where, where my life has taken me. No. The Lord forgave Israel over and over and over and over again. He was long-suffering with them because he loved them. He loves you. And he wants you to return to him as well. When we look in Luke 15's account of the prodigal son, we always focus on the one son. But it was twofold. There's the one son that left and spent his days literally wasting his life. And yet he comes and he returns to his father and the father rejoiced to have him there. But he had that other son with him the whole time. There's the other son that was there with him the whole time. And at the end of that parable, we see this son that he was there, but his heart was bitter. He was as far away from his father as his other brother who went away and wasted his life. Physically, he's there. Spiritually, his heart is gone. It's outward. It's, it's, it's far from the Lord as could be. And the Lord is long-suffering toward them both. He wants that son to come in to him as well. And you might be here every week, but you're bitter inside. You, inside your mind and heart, you're as far away from the Lord as the one that is showing it outwardly. And the Lord is long-suffering for you as well. Just as much as we rejoice as the person that's been out in the world in sin and they've come back, that person that inwardly has been doing that as well, the Lord wants you to come back to him as well. And he is long-suffering and asking you to return. And when I read this, I see 42 generations 42 generations of God's long-suffering toward his people. Is he any less long-suffering toward us today? Is he any less long-suffering toward now his children? Not his chosen people, his children. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are a child of God. And he wants you to come back. He sent his son to die in our place. And he wants us to follow him and to be in that relationship with him. There were two kept promises. There were three eras of long suffering. And I want you to see, lastly, there were four pictures of grace. Turn to Genesis, uh, to 1 Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 6. The last, character of, I want, uh, the last characteristic of God I want us to see deals with four ladies. Now, that's interesting to find in a genealogy. You typically don't see that. But in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we, have, we see here a picture of God's grace in action. And these, this is rough stuff. It just is. Now, it just flies through here. But the history of this, it's ugly. It really is. And you know what? Your history might be ugly today. The history of your family, maybe yours, but your, maybe some of the history in your family might be ugly. Every family has something like that in their life. That's just how it is. That's life living with a sinful nature. We see in verse 3, 
we're introduced to a lady named Tamar. And Judas, that's Judah, begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar. Down there in verse 5. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Then verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. And David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. That's Bathsheba. So verse 3, we're introduced to a lady named Tamar. Verse 5, we're introduced to Rahab and Ruth. And verse 6, Bathsheba. These four women. Here we have four women that God doesn't just list here. Think of the significance of this. They are in the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you were putting a line together, you're God for a second. That's scary, right? For any of us to even think that, right? But if you were mapping this out, you would have been looking for uh, the most impeccable character in everybody in that lineage, would you not? You would be looking for the finest of families to have our Lord and Savior come from. That is not what we see. This is not how God works. And honestly, it's a good thing for each and every one of us. You might think that with the things you've done or thought, you could never be a Christian. You, you look at the people of this church and you say, ah, uh, you know, they're going to look down their nose at me. Or, or they've got it all together and they, they don't have problems like I have. You could not be farther from the truth. That's not it. Friend, I can guarantee you that is not true. We are grateful that God is a God of grace, giving us what we don't deserve. And we are glad that God is a God of mercy, not giving us what we do deserve. Amen? So how do I know this? Well, look at these four ladies. Look at their situation. We have Tamar. Her life is found all the way back in the first pages of the Bible in Genesis chapter 38. It's almost a footnote in the life, between the life of Joseph there. Judah uh, is, is her husband. Well, he's not her husband right away. She intentionally has a relationship with her father-in-law. Yeah. To prove she was not being respected properly. Read that this week. Look at that in detail. That's Tamar. Then we have Rahab. Who's she? She's a prostitute that lived on the wall of Jericho when God was about ready to give the promised land to Israel. But she believed God, and she saved her family from destruction. She winds up marrying a Jewish man, which really should not have happened either. It should, it wouldn't have, her family would not have been accepted as, as a Jew for multiple generations as we read the law of God. Then we have just a generation later, her son, Ruth, Boaz marries Ruth. Now she's a woman of high, high character, but she's a Moabite. Moabites. Moabites are the descendants that come from an incestuous relationship. What? What? And Boaz marries her also outside of really what was permitted. Then we go a few generations and we get to Bathsheba. The black mark on David's life. It's not even, she's not even mentioned by name. She has an affair with King David, which results in her husband being murdered. And yet she raises her son to seek God and to be the next king of Israel. How do I know that God extends grace and mercy to us? Look at, the, look at these ladies. Look at their husbands. The, the situations that they were in. And yet God forgave them. He did more than forgive them. He used their lives to his glory. He used their lives. He turned them. And they, they bore these, these sons that would carry on this lineage of Jesus Christ. Men and women have sinned since Adam and Eve. And yet God promised from the very first sin that he was going to send a redeemer. And I'm no better than these ladies that I just mentioned or their, their husbands that they married. Neither are you. We're all sinners and each of us need forgiveness of sin. And that's the whole purpose of the Christmas season. 
That's the whole purpose of celebrating this. Jesus came for a purpose. Philippians tells us Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That baby. And being found in the fashion as man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. For God so loved the world, put your name there, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a picture of God's promises kept. His long suffering toward us and his grace that's given. Peter sums this all up in one verse. He says, the Lord is not slack. He's not lazy about this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His long-suffering, his promises kept, and grace will be delivered. Do you believe that today? Have you called out to Jesus Christ to save you, realizing that your sin has separated you from a loving father. God commendeth his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took your place. But you must accept that salvation, that gift of salvation. We talk about gifts all this season. Accept that gift that God has given us through salvation. And friends, if you're a Christian here today, are you believing in the promises of the Lord? Have you been stretching that long suffering of the Lord? Let us return to him today and start this new year afresh, serving the Lord as he would have us to do. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for your word. Please be with us. Our hearts are, are heavy. Our hearts are joyful as well for the promises that you've kept over the generations, showing how faithful you are. We thank you for your long suffering how you love and continue to give grace and mercy to us. For those that are lost, dear Heavenly Father, draw them to you now. They would come accept you as Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand.